Good morning. So good to see all of you. Welcome to the forum on the nicest day of the year in San Francisco. <laughs> you could tell the topic is great because it's, uh, we're, we're all glad to be here. Um, my name is Malcolm Young. I'm the Dean of Grace Cathedral, and we're um, celebrating St. Francis Day today. St. Francis is the patron of animals. So we have a dog here, and we have a cat over there. We have a few other human animals who are here today. Um, it's a perfect day to celebrate the close relationships that we have with animals, and to think a little bit about the uniqueness of ourselves as animals also. Our guest today is Dr. Robert Sapolsky. He's the John A. and Cynthia Fry Gunn Professor of Biology, Neurology, and Neurosurgery at Stanford. He is a research associate at the Institute for Primate Research at the National Museum of Kenya, and he has spent decades in the field studying the behavior of baboons. The focus of his career has been to understand human behavior in the context of biology, and his latest book is the fascinating Behave, the Biology of Humans at Our Best and Worst. So please join me in welcoming Robert Sapolsky. <laughs> I, um, I liked all, these, all three of these. I, um, so it was a primate's memoir and why zebras get the ulcer, and um, don't get ulcers was the other one <laughs> that I read the most and thought the most about. Um, and uh, one of my favorite things in this, um, we have a, a school here and I was talking to the boys and um, it was the story when you were a boy yourself and you would go to the dioramas uh, in New York City in the, in the um, Natural History Museum, and especially the gorilla diorama, and imagine yourself in that scene. And I um, talked about that with the boys and, and I remember feeling that way about the dioramas. I think they did too. <laughs> Um, so when you first, you, you, and you write in your book that you're disappointed that you didn't get to go to the gorillas, you got the baboons instead, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but you probably learned to love the baboons even more. <laughs> Some of them. Some of them, right? <laughs> exactly. I guess it's just like... Depends on... The individual <laughs> Yes, um, baboon. definitely personalities there. What was it like when you first got there? And, um, and, uh, and maybe you can talk about a, a particular individual that, that um, you remember, maybe, maybe one that you learned something from. Yeah, well, when I first got there, I could not have been more clueless. Um, I was about eight when I decided I wanted to be a primatologist. <laughs> um, and what I've noticed is of people who do field work, about two thirds of them grew up in the business in some way. Their parents were field researchers or missionaries or AID people or who knows what. And then the other third were my category, which was growing up in some god-awful urban neighborhood. And at some point, you stumbled into the Natural History Museum, and that was it. <laughs> get me out of here, <laughs> and that diorama, that's where I want to live. Yeah. And in my case, it happened to be the, the gorillas, the mountain gorillas. Um, and, you know, I, you were just telling me your, your son has taken Swahili. I, I was teaching myself Swahili in high school. Oh, I was great. writing fan mail to primatologists then and stuff, because um, I was totally set. Um, so, you know, I went and studied everything possible on the subject and studied with one of the kings of baboonology in college and was finally going out in the field. And the only problem was that I had never been south of Philadelphia <laughs> or north of Boston or west of, like, somewhere in Jersey. Um, so, like, I knew nothing about anything and was just sort of dumped out there. It turned out I had been taught the wrong kind of Swahili, oh. <clears throat> so nobody could understand anything I was saying. Um, I was taught Tanzanian Swahili, which is like the king's English. Right, it's like learning King James English. Yeah, yeah, and whereas in Kenya, everybody's Swahili is like your fourth language, so everybody is just barely getting by, and I, I could not have been less prepared for what I was doing there. Um, so I sort of got dumped out there when I was 20 after college and spent a year and a half setting up my field site and then managed to go back there every summer for 33 years. Yeah. Um, in terms of the baboons, uh, definitely, as you said, I, I loved mountain gorillas in a big abstract state. Baboons, savanna baboons, you have much more mixed feelings about because they're basically, they're foul animals. They're <laughs> awful, <laughs> awful animals. They're terrible to each other. They have the highest rates of violence of any non-human primate. 
um, the leading cause of death of my male baboons over the years were male baboons. Okay. Like they're, they're a good model for lots of aspects of human social stress. Um, they turned out to be perfect in that regard because if you're a baboon, like this was in the Serengeti ecosystem, which is like the greatest place on earth if you're a baboon. You only have to work about three hours a day for your calories. Um, you, you live in these big troops, so the lions don't mess with you much. Your kids have a better infant survival rate than the neighboring Maasai people do. Um, so with this critical implication, if you only have to work three hours a day for your calories, you've got nine hours of free time every single day to devote to being rotten to some other <laughs> baboon. All they do is generate social stress for each other. Yeah. Like, they don't get ulcers because some, like, the predators chase it. They get ulcers because some other baboon planned it. Um, <laughs> so they're incredible models for human psychosocial stress. So in that regard, they're not nice animals, but they're certainly interesting. Yeah. And they, you know, you, you develop affections for some of them. There was this one sub-adult male, a guy I named Benjamin, um, okay, disclaimer, I gave all of my baboons Old Testament names. and Which I'm grateful for because it made it so much easier to follow. <laughs> to yeah. and, and, then, and then there was some, you know, they're, they're, they're not random names. They're, no. There's like a reason. You say, ah, now I know why this is Benjamin. But then <laughs> there's the day where Nebuchadnezzar is off exactly. in the bushes with Ruthie and wondering how that happened. Right, completely. Um, so that's certainly a problem. But this one guy I got very attached to, the two of us got lost together once and sort of I'm the one who figured out where the troop was and he sort of like <laughs> imprinted on me at the time he was like he had just he was adolescent he had just transferred into the troop he had no idea what he was doing um, so he sort of glommed on to me and we this was my favorite baboon um, our son is named Benjamin. <laughs> our daughter, Rachel, is named for our favorite female oh, baboon. Right. So they, uh, this will come back to haunt us at some point. But, so, yeah, but amid that, there were definitely And what some you loved about Benjamin was, you know, he had, a different, he had a different strategy for relating with other baboons. Um, yeah, he was incredibly socially incompetent. Um, he spent most of his days stumbling into thorn bushes or sitting on, like, poisonous ants or things like that. He was, you know, it was very, he had crazy hair all over the place. Um, it was very hard not to identify with him feeling <laughs> very much, I mean, I sort of was in a sub-adult male stage at that point, so it was very easy to sort of do a lot of identifying with him. <laughs> What have you learned in just your life in the troop? I mean, um, just about things like parenting or, you know, just uh, about stress, how, how to get along with other people, even just uh, about just like marriage. I, I mean, it, it, was your marriage affected by all this time that you spent yeah. in the troop? <laughs> um, for better or worse, but I guess you'd have to ask my wife. My wife, who wound up doing eight seasons out there as well, doing her, oh, yeah, that her was good. doctorate on the baboons as well, on female baboons. Um, so fortunately, we shared the same taste for Old Testament names. Um, <laughs> I would say the biggest thing I learned was something I had absolutely not a chance of figuring out until I was about 40 or so and had wasted 20 seasons with the baboons. What, what I went out there initially to do, oh, Western humans, we don't die of cholera anymore. We die of stress-related diseases. We die of diseases of lifestyle. We live well enough and long enough that we have bodies that slowly fall apart over time. We get diseases of cardiovascular and cerebral. We get diseases of chronic stress, and we're completely unique in that regard. Um, and the baboons turned out to be a perfect parallel to that because, again, they were not getting stress-related diseases from lions. They were getting it from psychosocial stress. They're perfect models for westernized stress-related disease. So I went out there, um, and the plan was to study which baboons were more or less vulnerable to stress-related disease. I was able to dart these guys, anesthetize them, and what's their blood pressure, what's their cholesterol levels, how's this guy's immune system working, do workups on them out there, and then let them go. And I went out there as a 20-year-old thinking that what this was all gonna be about is if you have a choice in the matter, you wanna be a high-ranking baboon. Ah, social dominant, right. social, it's gonna be socially dominant males who are healthiest, who've got the 
lowest blood pressure, you've got the lowest stress hormone levels, and I spent like the next 20 years trying to show exactly how that worked. And what took me about 20 years to figure out, and it probably required me to be a middle-aged guy instead of a 20-year-old, which is figuring out that if you have a choice in the matter, do you want to be a high-ranking male baboon, or do you want to be a male baboon with a lot of grooming partners? The latter. Yeah, that actually. one is so much better of a predictor. Social affiliation, social outlets, relationships. And as a 20-year-old, I was going to go out and prove social dominance and hierarchy and you leave more copies of your genes and that turned out to have so little to do with what those guys were about. Um, so yeah, and everything we know about sort of psychosocial stress in humans, if you've got a choice between decreasing the stress in your life by getting more of a sense of control or more of a sense of outlet or more of a sense of predictability or more social support, Social support is the way to do it every single yeah, time in terms of health. That's so interesting. I mean, I, I think, I mean, when you're, you're, you're talking, especially in behave, I mean, I think of, um, there's so much that we just didn't know so recently. I, I mean, and it, it, your career spanned a time of just extraordinary breakthroughs in terms of how we understand what human beings are. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, you know, just what we've learned. Like, what did we not know about our bodies and ourselves, you know, in 1971, um, you know, versus now? I mean, what, 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 what like did, what almost everything. Yeah, um, yeah. It's I mean, sort of a theme in this book, Behave, which I just spent the last five years sitting at home writing. The glandular um, parts. I mean, just like the, the neurochemical uh, parts of our... The number... Well, one of the things I sort of do at the end, just reviewing the biology of what makes us rotten to each other and wonderful to each other and sort of the song and dance in there is you got to incorporate what's going on in your brain one second before a behavior, but also what stimuli a minute before triggers that brain and what hormone levels that morning made your brain more or less sensitive to those stimuli and what neural plasticity has gone on in your brain in previous months and back to your adolescence and childhood and your fetal life and the genes that were turned on and off for your lifetime due to fetal environment, your genes, the culture your ancestors came up with, evolution, all of that. And when you put all those pieces together, like the main punchline is we're biological organisms. There's nothing we do that's outside of the context of our biology. But the point there is it's mostly really subtle biology yeah. and it's mostly influences on our behavior that we haven't a clue have any relevance whatsoever. What happened to you when you were a third trimester fetus? Whether your ancestors were pastoralists or hunter-gatherers are going to have influenced the way your mother sang to you when you were a kid, what you had for breakfast, what you smelled 30 seconds ago. So this constant theme of there's all these subterranean biological influences yeah. on our behavior, and the vast majority of them we knew nothing about 20 years ago, 50 years ago, when you like Google, in like Google Scholar, a search term for anything that's relevant to this, testosterone and aggression. And you look at the papers that come out, all the scientific papers, and you look at them by year, and in the 1940s, there were this many papers, and the 1960s, there were this many, and by the 80s, this room, and 90% of the literature is 10 years old. And that's the case in all of these domains. The rate at which we are over and over being forced to say, oh, I had no idea biology had something to do with that is like exponentially increasing. Priming, like when did priming, when did we become aware of priming as an issue? So, you know, so if you, you give people, a, a, um, maybe you can give a better example of priming, but if you give somebody, two people, a, uh, a um, different kind of quiz and you mention old age terms in one of the quizzes, it takes yeah. them more time to walk down the hallway than the person yeah. who... Sto a sensory environment like that, absolutely. The, the definitive study in like every textbook there is, okay, two, two cliches out there. One is on the average, males are better at math than females. The other is on the average, Asian populations do better at math tests than non-Asian populations, both of which are highly questionable, but nonetheless are sort of standard folk wisdom. And this classic study, you have a bunch of Asian American high school girls, 
And beforehand, if you taking a math test, and beforehand, if you mention offhandedly, oh, isn't it interesting that on the average, males are better at math than females, afterward, math scores go down. If beforehand you say, oh, isn't it interesting that on the average, Asian Americans do better at math than non-Asian Americans, math scores go up, simply prompting which group you identify with at that point, influencing like how you remember your algebra equations. Or this, this is like one of my favorite examples out there. Um, wonderful study from a group at Yale. Sit somebody down and have them fill out a questionnaire about their political views social issues, economic, geopolitical, all of that, and if you put somebody in a room with bad smelling garbage, you become more socially conservative. You are more likely to disapprove of gay marriage. If you are heterosexual, you are more likely to dis doesn't do anything to your economic views, anything to your geopolitical ones. Part of how we decide whether when they are doing something that's different, whether that's so different that it's disgusting and it's wrong, 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 is we're getting sensory information. Bad smells make us more conservative. Have somebody drink something bad tasting, cod liver oil, and five minutes afterward, they advocate stronger punishment for norm violations, because you got a bad taste yeah. in your mouth. One classic study, um, this was looking at more than 5,000 court decisions of parole boards. Um, it happened to be in Israel, the judges there, every single parole board case over the course of a country, over the course of a year, looking at who got sent back to jail, who got paroled. The single best predictor of what a judge was going to decide was how many hours it had been since the judge had had a meal. See a judge right after lunch, 60% parole rate, by three, four hours later, down to 0%. Judge has a snack, back up again. And the remarkable right. thing about that is you sit one of those judges down and yeah, you they say... Don't believe, they couldn't believe they, that. I'm, no. I'm a fair, I, each case is different, Absolutely. and I would weigh yes. the issues. Or worse, they're going to quote Rawls or Nietzsche to right. you. Right, completely. A theory of justice. <laughs> yes, and it's <laughs> blood sugar levels have something to do with how well you your brain does the harder thing when that's the right thing to do, as opposed to saying, ah, lock them away, send them back again. Like, so priming all this subterranean stuff going on I, all the I time I used there. that quote of the subterranean, because that was one direct quote that you couldn't help but use in the, in the books. But th that's just th that world of dreams, imagination. I mean, it, it seems like such an important part of the religious life is just, you know, these intuitions that we have that we're not even conscious of. And, you know, um, it, but yep. I, I, I was thinking a lot, of, you know, just this last week with the, the with Brett Kavanaugh hearings and the confirmation yesterday, and I kept thinking just, you know, just from your perspective as a neuroscientist, talking about how memory works. I mean, like, what counsel or advice would you give people in terms of understanding, you know, events that happened a long time ago or just, you know, what was your whole take on that thing? Um, I actually had a piece last Friday in CNN, the op-ed thing, um, honing in on something that a lot of Republicans uh, seemingly honed in on when she was asked to describe what had occurred to her Ford and had spectacular searing amount of details about the event in the bedroom amid not being able to say whose house and when exactly it was and what you did afterward. And a lot of folks saying, well, isn't that strange? That's a rather selective memory. That seems rather. And CNN asked me to do a piece on how the brain files away memories during trauma. And it turns out what she was describing is exactly what the brain does. You remember this part and the rest of it is utterly irrelevant. You remember this part to your like dying day and the rest of it, and there's like this wonderful classic study that showed this. Um, take people, one group of volunteers, you told them a 12 sentence story, totally boring. Boy and his mother walk through town, they walk past the drugstore, they walk and they cross the street, they go to the hospital where the boy's father works and they go to visit him and he shows them the x-ray room and the surgery room and then they go back home afterward. The other group's story, 12 sentences long, boy and his mother go walking through town, they pass the drugstore, they cross the street where the boy is hit by a truck and terribly injured and they rush him to the hospital and take him to the x-ray room and operate and all of that. 
So they tell people these two different versions, one or the other, and then a week later, people had to recall the story. And what you see is people who got the terrifying, horrific story remembered it better than the people who got the boring one. They only remembered the sentence five onward from when the boy was hit. The memory for the rest of it was, if anything, worse than in other folks. And what you see there is you remember the part that matters, the rest of it's irrelevant. She also, those of you who sort of listened to sort of her testimony, um, she's a clinical psychologist, she has a PhD, she was explaining this part of the brain, the hippocampus, which is like my favorite part of the brain. <laughs> so I was like thrilled when that occurred. And her saying, it's got, it's got something to do with epinephrine and norepinephrine, epinephrine also known as adrenaline and norepinephrine, a closely related version, which is the neurochemicals that tell your hippocampus, remember this part forever, forever, that part who cares about. In this particular study, what they then showed was if you blocked epinephrine and norepinephrine, you didn't have the enhanced memory for the scary part of the story. So, yeah, that's exactly how the brain works. So I hoped that sort of doing that in CNN would like change one eighth of somebody's vote there. <laughs> well, I thought about that a lot too. I mean, it's just um, um, <laughs> no. when you're talking about the, uh, your, your own scientific research, like how do you find that balance? I mean, we're so grateful that you took the time to write these books because I, I, I want to know what we're learning in these fields, um, but it must be hard to, de to decide. Like how do you decide how much you spend on your original research versus you know, kind of sharing with CNN and, and, and writing books like these? Well, I actually actually made the decision five years ago that I, I closed my lab yeah. um, and stopped my research. My Kenyan work had fallen apart a few years before for political reasons. So I decided it was time to shift gears and produce this yeah. god-awful 800-page thing. Well, I'm glad you wrote the appendices. The appendices <laughs> were so helpful because I, I needed that basic biology lesson. Well, uh, me too, as it turned out. So <laughs> that was very... So, yeah, that was a shift. I. You know, do you, if you live in a lab, I had like 25 people in my lab at the time, and you realize your entire sense of like self-worth and like trust in the universe is dependent on like if somebody figured out why the tissue cultures are contaminated this week, oh, or yeah. if somebody's statistical test came up with a sufficient like p-value to be able to publish it, and like, okay, like it's just minutia of lab science, and like 35 years of it, it was kind of, time to shift gears so spending four years sitting at home in the hate sort of obsessing over this stuff and yeah. so definitely a, a shifting of gears so I'm spending most of my time now working on actually death penalty cases involving people with brain damage um, right. and trying to teach juries about the brain so it's it's been a big shift yeah that um, is th th those parts about criminal justice system were very compelling to me yeah um, <laughs> you know not too many juries as it's turning out oh, but it's too bad I I, um, I yeah. found them very compelling I mean could you talk a little bit about just you know what how we should restructure the criminal justice system just given what we or we're starting to know about how the brain, and how the whole body functions? Um, basically, I think every single aspect of the criminal justice system is sheer raving medieval gibberish, yeah. um, which often is viewed as kind of off-putting when I first kind of voiced this to say a bunch of lawyers or judges or such. Um, I actually taught a class last week at the, the law school um, for the first week That's students I'm sort glad. of went in That's a great way to get said, them you're all in the wrong profession and if I do my job right, you should quit law school by the end of today. <laughs> so that, that didn't go over any well. Um, evil, punishment, retributive justice makes no sense yeah. whatsoever when you spend enough time studying about the brain. Currently, the American criminal justice system recognizes one component of neurobiology, and it's something called the McNaughton Rule, oh, yeah, right. um, which is if you are so thought disordered that you can't tell the difference between right and wrong, a jury can find you organically impaired, insane sufficiently so that you're sent to a psychiatric hospital instead of a prison. This was invoked, for example, when John Hinckley tried to kill Reagan. Hinckley, paranoid schizophrenic, classic sort of test case for McNaughton, difference between right and wrong. 
McNaughton was a guy in England in 1840 who, by everything we can tell, sort of paleo forensics, was paranoid, schizophrenic, was hearing voices tormenting him, telling him to try to kill the prime minister, and he wound up killing the person standing next to him, whatever, and this was the first time a jury said, this guy is so thought disordered that he can't tell the difference between right and wrong, lock him up in a, in a hospital for the rest of his life where he obliged everyone by being dead from TB within a year or two. Um, but that was McNaught. That's it. 1840, 1840 neuroscience, that's the criminal justice systems incorporation of neurobiology. And most states in this country, after Hinckley, got away with trying to kill Reagan. Most states in this country, predominantly in the more conservative ends, don't even allow a McNaughton defense. And then you got another thing that creeps in, which is a part of the brain called the frontal cortex. Um, it's the most interesting part of the brain. I often decide I waste a decade studying the stupid hippocampus instead of studying the frontal cortex. What does the frontal cortex do? It makes you do the right thing when that's the harder thing to do. Impulse control, long-term planning, gratification postponement, emotional regulation. It's the last part of the brain that evolved in us. We've got more of it than any other species. It isn't fully online in us until we're 25 years old. It's the last part of the brain to fully develop. And what's the frontal cortex do? The frontal cortex makes you do the harder thing. 25%, thanks, 25 um, <laughs> 25% of the men on death row in this country have a history of concussive head trauma to the frontal cortex. And when you have a damaged frontal cortex, you have someone who knows the difference between right and wrong. They can give you wonderfully prudent advice as to the emotionally regulated things you should do in your life. They can sit there, put in a testing situation, and say exactly why this is the thing, the choice to make, even though that's kind of tempting, and which is why they're exactly good. And then, every time, they go for the wrong one. This is a world of people who know the difference between right and wrong, and they have involitional organic impairment. Nonetheless, they can't regulate their behavior. So you look at something dramatic, like somebody's frontal cortex was blown out in a car accident when they were eight, and this is a pretty dramatic example. But then you ask in a much more subtle realm, so what are some of the other things that influence how well your frontal cortex is working? how much stress hormones you were exposed to when you were a fetus. Whether your mother was stressed like crazy, her stress hormones get past the placenta into your circulation, and the most sensitive part of the brain to them is the frontal cortex. What socioeconomic status you were raised in in your first five years of life. This was work pioneered here by Tom Boyce at UCSF in Berkeley, first showing by age five, if you were stupid enough to have picked the wrong family to have been born into, by age five, your socioeconomic status is a predictor of your stress hormone levels and the lower your SES, the higher the stress hormone levels, and the less developed your frontal cortex is. The thinner it is, the lower its metabolic rate. I bet if any of you were at any point neurotic parents, you know about the marshmallow test yeah. and how long five-year-olds can hold out for, and already at age five, your SES and your stress hormone levels and your frontal cortical thickness are predictors of how well you do on the marshmallow test, which already now is a predictor of 50 years later how likely you are to be overweight, how likely you are to have diabetes, how likely your lifelong earning, things of that. So by age five, your socioeconomics, but also how much sleep you got last night, how many hours it's been since you've eaten a meal, how high your testosterone levels are if you're male. What do you know? Testosterone turns out to do stupid things to your frontal cortex, and your judgment goes out the window, where you are in your ovulatory cycle, what everything in between, and this entire world of, at those critical moments, do you do the right thing, even though it's the harder thing to do, is a purely biological phenomenon. And then we invent words like evil, and punishment, and retribution, and yeah. it's, you, you don't, like, you have a car 
whose brakes are broken, you obviously don't let it out on the street being driven. It's dangerous. It can, and you fix it if you can. And if you can't fix it, you lock it up in the garage for the rest of time. But you don't sit there and say, that car deserves not to be able to take a ride in the park on a Sunday afternoon when it's beautiful out. Its brakes are broken. And we're biological machines. And this is a shift that is beyond certainly the American criminal justice system by centuries worth of insight. Yeah, and what, I mean, one of the things that you write about um, a, f a few times is just inequality. I mean, just like how destructive and damaging inequality is. I mean, it, it, and it's, it, it's, a, it's a major public health crisis for us. I, I guess you don't quite say it in that way, but... Um, um, it certainly is. Um, it's a massive one. When you look at... Okay, another bandwagon. Scientific American has an issue coming out. Next issue is on inequality in the United States, and I have an article in there on the, the health effects of it. When you look at the upper 10 percentile of income in this country and the bottom 10 percentile, in percentile um, life expectancy difference is more than 20 years. This is the scale of difference between like Bethesda, Maryland, and Angola. When you look at these issues there, it just it's an enormous, enormous difference. Virtually every disease out there, from cardiovascular to psychiatric to gastrointestinal to inflammatory, etc., show a socioeconomic gradient. The further you are down the SES ladder, the worse your health. The more prevalence of disease, the worse the impact it has. And what's been one of the most striking things, like incredibly smart people have been studying this for 50 years, why you see an SES gradient in every westernized country that's been examined. So obvious answer, poor people have less access to health care. That doesn't explain it in the slightest, because you see the gradients in countries with socialized medicine, universal health care, and you see the gradients for diseases where it doesn't matter how many doctors' checkups you get, it doesn't affect the incidence of juvenile diabetes, and still you get the gradient. Ah, okay, it's because poor people have higher rates of smoking, higher rates of drinking to excess, higher rates of imprudently living next to toxic waste dumps, things that you control for those. That explains only about a third of the variability. Ah, poor people can't afford to have the protective factors. You don't get the vacations, you don't get the health clubs, you don't get, that explains a tiny percentage of the variability. What it's about is the psychological stress of being poor. And the best evidence for that is, it's not so much being poor, it's feeling poor. Right. This was work pioneered by Nancy Adler here at UCSF, looking at people's objective socioeconomic status versus subjective. How do you feel you're doing compared to other people? And it turns out your subjective SES is a better predictor of your health than your objective. It's not being poor, it's feeling poor. And what is it that is the surest way to make the poor feel poor? Rubbing their noses in it. Work by a guy named Richard Wilkinson in the UK showing income inequality, independent of absolute levels of income, is the thing that drives the socioeconomic gradient. It's not being poor, it's being poor surrounded by the haves and being reminded of it over and over. So sort of the final piece of that is work done by a guy at Harvard Public Health named Achira Kawachi, who has shown sort of what happens when you have high degrees of income inequality in a community, social capital goes down. Right, right, I was gonna ask you about that. People stop trusting each other. Yeah. People stop having a sense of efficacy. Social capital, this is this term the sociologist Robert Putnam came up with, with this sort of famous book of his encompassing this notion of bowling alone. Right. The number of people in the United States who bowl has been climbing for years. The number of people who are in bowling leagues has been plummeting. Social connectedness, that is the metaphor for it. And you want to study vast amounts about social capital, you ask two, two questions of people in a community. On the average, can you trust people or not? And how many organizations do you belong to? And it turns out when income inequality goes way up, what happens is people stop trusting each other. Trust is built around symmetrical reciprocating relationships. And by definition, what a steep hierarchy does is make it impossible to have easy symmetrical relationships because there's less symmetry. The second question you ask people is how many organizations you belong to because when 
inequality becomes rampant, tenant unions don't work very well. People don't bother joining unions of any sort. People don't join organ because you have no sense of collective efficacy. Those are the media. So it's not so much being poor, it's feeling poor, which consists of being reminded of it by inequality because you then wind up in communities that are less healthy, less safe, less kind, less generous, and that winds up being the mediator for that. And that one's like a catastrophe. Yeah, and uh, it's the story of you know why churches look the way they look, why the Elks Club looks the way that it looks now, why you know yeah. um, every such kind of even just political. I mean, how people participate in politics is is much more atomized than um, social and in the ways Absolutely. it has been in the past. Um, and this, you know, it's, it's easy to get on a bandwagon about this. And in terms of degree of social inequality, the United States is the poster child for it. And all it's been doing is getting worse since the 80s, since Reagan, a steep increase since then. It bottomed out in the 60s, has been rising since, and then bid a big inflection curve around then. In terms of average social capital, the U.S. has less of it than any other European Western culture out there. Oh my God, we're yeah, such a mess. It, it has um, to, I mean, 1971, when they didn't know that the, the, the um, parts of the brain were secreting uh, hormones in 1971, you know, there, you, you, there was a 90% tax bracket. I mean, you could pay 90% taxes in 1971. Yep. And, and something happened to that picture happened. of what society is like. Yeah. So it's amid that, you know, it's easy to get on sort of rant about that, but that's kind of what makes this country what it is for better or worse. Um, I mean, on a certain level, like our, our God-given rights as Americans are to be mobile, to be anonymous, to be like, go move away from where you grew up, go change your name, get rid of your accent. Once you go to college, your regional embarrassing accent, go do what, go reinvent yourself. You can't invent Silicon Valley among hunter-gatherers. This has <laughs> to be the world's mecca for misanthropes who have very little need for social connectiveness and social community, and this is the the world where like you go when I when I've finished grad school in New York City um, I went and did a two-year postdoc in San Diego at the Salk Institute yeah, right. and you go when you do a postdoc you were there for only one reason which is to get three reasons you're there to get a lot of publications learn a whole bunch of techniques in a lab that does different stuff in the lab you did your PhD in and then go get a job somewhere and you're there for two years and you were there to work like a maniac and like I lived somewhere and in my two years living there I never exchanged a word with my neighbors and among like my friends in Kenya like that is a psychiatric symptom if you like don't speak to your neighbors, that is like, yeah. and what this here is like buffing up your resume so you can get it. I'm here for two years. I'm not here to make friends. I'm here to work 80 hour weeks in a lab and like hooray, somebody gave me a job afterward. Like this is, yeah, the whole this is part of what- The political structure depends yeah. on some kind of equality. And we on a certain level have signed up for this. I mean, amid it being very easy to bellyache about our breakdown of communities and all that. Like, I would not want to still be like living next door to my parents' house and pairing, caring for the grandchildren, cows of their cows, and <laughs> marrying someone who like learned how to pluck chickens in our little shtetl or whatever. Like, yeah, there's advantages to this. And then along comes something like 9-11 and we discover we don't know the names of our neighbors and yeah. like how to go and like so double-edged swords. I've like asked you so many questions of things that I've read about in here, but, I, but there's been something I've been just dying to ask you from the moment I started reading these things. You know, the, um, like the Ray Kurzweil and those artificial intelligence people who are our neighbors to the south of us. <laughs> Um, what, is, what are your thoughts about that whole, those kinds of discussions? You know, like the singularity in 2032, the machine's gonna be smarter than the humans. I mean, it, 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 in, from a humanity's perspective, we're, we're, real, we're realizing more that we're not just abstract consciousness, we're embodied humans, our bodies are much more important. And I wonder for you who studies, you know, those dominance displays and, and primate behavior and brain function, I mean, how that, that, that artificial intelligence conversation, what does it sound like to you? Um, mostly terrifying. I, I, <laughs> hope, I hope terrifying just because I'm utterly ignorant. Um, our son, 
Benjamin, Benjamin. Um, <laughs> is a is a CS person yeah. at Stanford doing artificial intelligence. This this was his edible revenge on me it of is, his great. his being being able to be contemptuous of neurons and how <laughs> computationally primitive they are. Um, <laughs> so depending on his mood, which I suspect has a lot to do with sort of social emotional priming issues having nothing to do with computer science, depending on his mood, um, either like we're all going to be uploaded onto chips and the first immortal people are already alive and like that sort of thing. Or if he's in a bad mood, we're about 20 years away from being harvested for our carbon by the, <laughs> by the machines. Um, so collectively, I'm not sure how terrified to be, but it does sound fairly scary. Um, yeah. You know, on the most fundamental level, it's scary when I'm separate of like obvious stuff. Like not only will most like working class jobs be made obsolete by machines, but doctors are going to be put out of business soon by machines. AIs are better at spotting melanomas than human dermatologists are by now. Radiology, reading for tumors, things of that sort. Right. Um, you know, on the objective level like that. But the fact that we're going to get to a point where we really can't tell the difference between whether we are talking to a person or a machine, let alone which one we prefer. Um, this is kind of scary. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for me, it's just, um, it, there can't be an alternate humanity that just that didn't evolve, but was just invented by us. Do you know what I mean? So I do, I, I do wonder about that part, like about dreams and desires. And I mean, just all those irrational parts, the subterranean parts that you were talking about, that we're more aware of even. That, yep. you know, are, are machines going to have dreams? Are they going to have to have dreams in order for us to, yeah. You know, but anyway, so I'm, I, I'm glad you, you, you you're, it's like dinner table conversation for you guys. <laughs> you, well, it, it, it usually ends in like, a combination of complete technological confusion on the part of my wife and I and, and thinly veiled contempt from our son, but it's, it's pretty interesting up until then. <laughs> so one of our traditions um, at the forum is we, um, take, we take questions. Um, so Rebecca Nessel is um, gathering the questions. Um, so please um, just go ahead and, and let us know what questions you have. Um, in uh, um, one of my favorite parts of Behave was the section on us versus them. I just thought that was just so helpful for, you know, just putting a context in, in all those tensions and distrust and um, stereotypes and prejudices. I mean, it's just so much of our newspapers are about that experience of us versus them. And you talk a little bit about Jonathan Haidt's work on, um, on values and, um, yeah. you know, kind of the differences. In, and you mentioned it earlier about the smells and the conservative parts. Um, is there anything about biology that you that you've been paying attention to, especially just as as the is the Trump administration kind of on, on you know their work begins to um, take hold? And I mean, like um, when people when you see those rallies on television, you know, as a primatologist, as a neuroscientist, what are you thinking is going on for those people, and um, and, and, and 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 what does it mean? Well. I was so hoping you were to say as the Trump administration unravels, but well, I was thinking no. that too. You know. uh, undoes yeah. decades of social progress. It's a little bit of both yesterday. because there's so many people um, quitting and so many, you know, and, and yet so many, yeah. You know, the, Thanks. Uh, you know, <laughs> I'm human. <laughs> My frontal cortex is of only limited power. I'm perfectly capable of wallowing in tremendous vituperative anger and all of that, it takes a lot of work to remember what makes people who they are. Yeah. And people don't become who they are in the worst guises and the most damaging ones outside of the context of invariably a lot of pain, a lot of fear, and a lot of deprivation, and a lot of adversity, and all of that. And if you can sort of find a way to like figure out that it's very meaningful that 90% of people who were murderers in this country have a whole conglomeration of what are termed adverse childhood experiences that set you up for a brain that has a whole lot of trouble with empathy and impulse control and long-term planning and things of that sort. If like it's capable of using biology to reason through a point of deciding they are as troubled of machines as I am a lucky machine, um, to do the same thing for like, <laughs> Brett Kavanaugh or like anybody else in that category. Um, you know, something that comes out of Jonathan Haidt's work, he's a 
social psychologist at NYU who's done wonderful work addressing this whole issue of moral decisions that we make. How much do we think our way to a moral decision versus how much do we feel our way? And it's obvious that Western philosophy has spent hundreds of years saying, hey, this is thinking, and <clears throat> thank God we're such cognitively gifted, and all we have to do is understand moral developmental stages and children and theory of mind and all of that. And give ethics classes. <clears throat> and ethics classes. <laughs> and what hate <clears throat> has been sort of the most visible a sort of discoverer of is the extent to which we feel our way to our moral decisions and our cognitions then race to play catch up afterward to make it sense, make sense of when we say, I can't put my finger on it, but when they do that, it is so, so, I just figured out why it is they are so, so wrong. It is post hoc rationalization rather than rational, rationalizing, <coughs> rather than, than rational thought. Um, Something that comes out of his work. So we rationalize our emotional experience. Exactly. And neurobiologically, the best way of showing that is you give somebody, you know, a bunch of moral scenarios, is this right, wrong, whatever, and you stick them in a brain scanner and the emotional parts of your brain activate before your frontal cortex does. And what your emotional parts do, which parts do what, are a better predictor of the decision you make <coughs> than what your cortex does. What comes out of that is this incredibly important dictum, which is you can't reason somebody out of a stance they weren't reasoned into in the first place. If you can't address the emotional pains and the emotional tumult and the emotionality that brought people to where they are and some of our worst, ugliest moments, um, rationality isn't going to get somebody into a different spot than that. Right. And I think... You know, America somewhere around November 4th, 2016, discovered, oh, the disenfranchised, angry, pointless, lower working class, uneducated white American male, and the revenge that he just had in the polling booth yesterday kind of thing. Um, yeah, you can't reason somebody out of something they weren't reasoned into. Most of where our stances are coming from is from emotions, and there's a lot of subterranean emotional pain that brings people to where they are. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean again, that that huge, massive change in inequality is is. I mean, and it's something that we've just never experienced before, and um, and we're starting to see, see the effects of that in all sorts of different ways. Um, here's a um, my 28 year. So I've got a bunch of ones. So I'm, we're going to have to start picking up the speed. <laughs> okay. Um, my, well, we don't have to, but I mean, <laughs> my 28 year old daughter is a child therapist. Which of your books would she, you suggest she read? Probably why zebras don't get ulcers, um, which is about stress, stress-related disease, and what it's mostly about is social, psychosocial factors in health. I really like primates' mer mem mem memoir too, so I, I might like even begin with that. that. Um, what is the role <laughs> of stress in your own life? Oh, that was, I read about oh, that too, and you want to um, um, terrible <laughs> at handling stress, um, like. Why else would somebody spend 40 years working 80 hour a week studying a subject if they weren't inherently really bad at handling it? Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, at some point I'm gonna just keel over dead from a heart attack and that's gonna ruin all the book sales as a result <laughs> because my credibility is gonna go down the tubes. You know, I'm from that tribe of very driven, very motivated, very long-term planning sort of folks that are way familiar in our part of the country and in academia. So it's not something I deal with yeah. very well. The soccer be. is good. Keep playing soccer. Well, that, that unfortunately... I figured it couldn't because yeah. I mean, eventually you can't do that. Well, <laughs> lumbar discs turn yeah. out not to be <laughs> quite what you would want them to what be. What do you know about the biology of quote-unquote awkwardness? I, know, I thought that was a good Lots, question. Lots, as it out turns there. out. Um, <laughs> Well, awkwardness. I think that's a constellation of a bunch of things. When you look at the genetics of behavior, and I can like pontificate ha -ha, for hours and hours about how little genes actually do have to do with human behavior, one of the realms where there is a stronger genetic component, which is not to say it's the majority of what goes on, but a stronger one, is introversion, extroversion. That one seems to have relatively large genetic load 
got much more to do with the hormone exposure back when you were a fetus, but genes have something. Introversion, extroversion, that's got something to do with social awkwardness. Turns out probably the most prevalent psychiatric disorder in the world right now is anxiety, anxiety disorders, <clears throat> and one of its major subtypes is social anxiety. It's an enormously difficult skill to learn social intelligence. It's got much to do with the fact that our frontal cortex, again, isn't there until about 25 years because you don't just learn rules of social behavior, you gotta learn all the rules of acceptable hypocrisy and rationalization and why you're an exception to what is otherwise a very, very sensible rule, but here's why my particular circumstances make me an exception to And that's hard stuff to navigate. You said that in navigate. here that two thirds of everyday interactions are gossip. <laughs> That, <laughs> yes. I mean, so, I mean, that, that's part of awkwardness, too. Maybe you just don't want to deal with that. <laughs> or you're not very good at it, you're or you're not, it. not the person they want to gossip with yeah, yeah. and they want to gossip about instead. And this is based on, like, anthropologists go and sit around the campfire with Inuits or with Sami in northern Finland or Hadza in Tanzania, and you keep track of what people are talking about. And an enormous percentage of what humans have talked about since we invented language was who's doing what with who, who they're not supposed to be, and who's like, and not getting pat over the hill. And that's, as it's been said, revenge is, uh, gossip is the revenge of the weak yeah. in society. So here's a question. Um, I'm a new parent, and I've heard of the quote unquote parrot mind opposed to the square mind. Um, is there evidence for this? How do I access the parent mind in an optimal way? I've never heard of uh, this. I wish I had known about 15, 20 years ago. Um, <laughs> let's good. see, just falling back on biology, um, there is, as everyone who has ever done so will attest to, there is something vaguely resembling biologically a mommy brain, which is to say that at the time, if you are lactating, if you are nursing regularly, that sort of thing, various hormones related to that blunt some aspects of memory. What do you know? You're not quite as good at doing math or remembering long lists of words. You're much better at keeping track of social relations. There's a shift in cognition due to the hormones related to being post parturitional lactation. Males' testosterone levels go down after they become fathers, and the more they go down, that's a predictor of the more involved of a father they're going to be. And this turns out to be found in every pair bonding species on Earth. There's a whole biology of the shifts then. Um, <clears throat> it's a time where your biology screams about being really, really, really concerned about us's versus thems, but it's a time where the brain is extremely malleable as to who counts as an us. Yeah. Because after all, your universe just completely transformed over having at the center of it someone you didn't know back before you went into labor. You were very malleable at that point as to who counts as a very fundamental us. Here's another question. Trauma seems to be deeply ingrained in the human brain. Can you speak to this and how it relates to neuroplasticity? Do you find the same stickiness in other primates? Yep. Um, you know, there's a an epidemic of post-traumatic stress disorder now with people coming back from our various foreign ventures in Afghanistan, etc. Much of it having to do with the fact that we're keeping people alive now from battlefield injuries that we used to not be able to. So they come back physically and or psychiatrically crippled. We're learning tons about PTSD and what the traumatized brain does. And one of the things that shows is <clears throat> sort of a double-edged quality to one of the irresistible, trendy things in neuroscience these days, which is neural plasticity. Right, right. Whoa, the brain re changes in response to experience. Spen become a musician, a serious musician, and you expand the amount of your auditory cortex that's devoted to detecting the sound of your musical instrument. Whoa, your brain changes in all sorts of ways, and this could be totally amazing. You come back traumatized beyond whatever, and one piece of neuroplasticity is a part of the brain called the amygdala, which does fear and anxiety and aggression. You have PTSD, and your amygdala neuroplastically gets bigger than normal, and it has trouble shutting off. 
and thus you never ever feel safe. So this business of neuroplasticity is very exciting, but a brain can suddenly work a whole lot better, better at being afraid, better at more efficiently ethnically cleansing villages, yeah. better at keeping track of where the thems are hiding. It's, right, it's a double-edged sword. That was great. That was exactly what you did set in the book, too. Um, in popular vernacular, what life hacks are most helpful in support of healthy frontal cortex functioning? Oh, God. I never thought of that. That's a good one. <laughs> well, this shows how out of it I am. I am unfamiliar with what a life hack is. Um, but let me just perhaps generalize it into what could make for a stronger frontal cortex and maybe in the realms of rather than a better frontal cortex at holding on until you could take your company public, maybe a better frontal cortex when it comes to doing the harder thing, when it comes to being like decent to people or not. Um, what the studies show are force your brain to take somebody else's perspective. I'm not asking you to agree with them, but if they had to say why they are so upset about what's been done to them and their people, what would they say? Force your brain to individuate other people. Yes, they are part of this category, but what do you, what do you suppose? Do you suppose they like broccoli or do they like cauliflower? What do you suppose was their favorite birthday party they ever had? What a, and individuation, perspective taking, things of that sort, focusing on the fact that other people are malleable as well induces malleability of our own views. And these are not just sort of knee jerk, this is like research that's been done. Take Israelis and Palestinians and force them to do perspective taking and then afterwards see if you have a change in their viewpoints, things of that. Those are exercises that make your frontal cortex stronger in the Sounds most important realms. Sounds interesting, it's like reading a novel it has that effect. I never thought about um, you know, <coughs> wh why that's such a, I mean, it takes so much work. I mean, the, I mean, the energy that the brain consumes, it takes yep. a lot of work. And then, Wonderful study with that published in Nature a few years ago from the new school for social research, not a hotbed for publishing in sort of science yes. journals. <laughs> and what they looked at were the effects of reading popular fiction versus reading literature. Wow. Literature may be best defined as books, books you were forced to read rather than you would want to read. <laughs> books where characters' motivations are ambiguous, where resolutions are not all that resolved, where plot lines are... And you spend a bunch of time <clears throat> being forced to read literature versus popular fiction, and you get better at theory of mind right. with literature. You get better at perspective taking because yeah. you're spending more time dealing with the fact that other people think and feel different things than you do. Right, exactly. Could you talk about education? Um, is now how we edu is how we educate children at odds with our biology? Oh God, don't start me on that. Um, <laughs> we can't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Um, Maybe. <laughs> probably in the most fundamental way is one that like is like, oh yeah, good luck with that one. What should be clear is I don't have a whole lot of belief in free will. Um, and I spend an awful lot of time thinking about what the world is supposed to look like if people actually started accepting how much we are purely biological machines and how the answer should not be. We all just get to run amok at that point. Um, but the whole realm, like if you're any like decent parent, you like obsessed crazily over your child having an internal locus of control and good self-esteem and all of that. And what we have to like teach our kids much more of is predominantly the kids of people in an audience like this, I would guess, is how much they are just nothing other than the outcome of just sheer, utter biological luck of picking the right <laughs> womb, picking the right family, picking yeah. the right neighborhood, picking the right history of vaccinations or clean water or distance from neighboring warlords and things of that sort. And like that's the biological thing I think that needs to be hammered into our kids because the sort of kids I think we tend to produce are ones who are much too readily instead tempted towards a sense of, I have something to do with the magnificent right, person right. that I am. 
That's what you say over and over again. It's just um, the, the higher in socioeconomic status, the more likely you are to attribute your success to your own, you know, qualities yeah. or what have you. <laughs> System justification. System justification. Hey, Completely. I'm here where I am for a good reason. Yeah, exactly. Because nobody else could be the Supreme Court justice but me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <Hi. laughs> Well, <coughs> <laughs> moving right along. <laughs> right. <laughs> so this is the last question we have. You have emphasized the effect of stress in your work. What is its effect on society as a whole, particularly regarding massive changes such as social and environmental degradation to the point of societal collapse? Oh, that. Um, <laughs> this is another one of those where if you had asked me 30 years ago when I was obsessing over stress biology, I would have had a completely different emphasis than now. Um, I had a guy who sort of became kind of a mentor father figure to me, a guy named Meyer Friedman, um, who older San Francisco residents here might remember the Meyer Friedman Institute on Scott Street. Meyer Friedman was the cardiologist at UCSF in the 1950s who discovered type A personality. Um, and spent a whole career doing that, and he became sort of a father figure to me and mentor in my career. He died age 92. He saw his last patient a week before he died. He was still seeing patients at UCSF Medical Center. He used to say, I'm still type A, but I'm a type A tortoise now, um, in terms of how much he had slowed down. As a 90-year-old, he was still furious when his group's papers were rejected because some idiot reviewer didn't understand the statistics. And what he would do, I, he had his Meyer Friedman Institute, and he would get all these 40-year-old CEOs who had just had their first heart attacks and had come in to join his six-month program to completely change their stress lifestyle. And I would sit in on some of these, and he would always give the first lecture, and then he would turn it over to his team. And his first lecture was about how he used to be so type A. He had his first heart attack when he was 50 and made some massive changes in his life and 92 years old and all of that. And he would give this talk about how type A he used to be, and he wouldn't talk about his first heart attack. He would talk about what a son of a bitch he was back when, and how awful he was to this nurse and to this secretary and all of that. And at his funeral, I talked to his like 60-year-old kids who confirmed that's exact, that was not a rhetorical device he had. He really was awful until he, and at one point, I sort of looking at this, asked him one day, so, okay, are you in this business to make people have healthier hearts, or are you in this business to make people nicer to each other? And he said, absolutely the latter. If I have to terrify people through their heart problems into being sort of nicer people to each other, when you look at what chronic stress does, it does bad stuff to your bladder and your spleen and your gonads and your heart and your, all of this. It does bad stuff to your memory and your self-control and your impulses and your long-term planning. It does bad things to your vulnerability to depression and to anxiety. What I now realize after decades of this is one of the most interesting, important things that stress does is it decreases our capacity for empathy. Yeah. And we even know exactly what part of the brain that involves and which stress hormones do it. Some of the last research I did in my lab was on stuff with that. And that's probably, it's not only that stress makes us unhealthy and forgetful and maybe even demented and dead earlier, stress makes us tunnel visioned in terms of who counts as an us and whose pains you can feel. And that's the most important manifestation, I think. Yeah. There's so much more to say, and I'm so grateful for you for being here. <laughs> I, I wanted to ask you more questions about religion. There are a few people who also wanted to do that. Um, but um, <laughs> and there's so much more, too, about what you were just saying, that the, that the, the way that empathy, uh, that, we, that we can just literally not feel the pain of people who we regard as others. But I do recommend um, the books to read. Um, and, and I look forward to our next conversation, because I, I, like I say, I have so many more things in there, not just <laughs> the artificial intelligence. I'm glad that you had been talking to your son about that. Um, being lectured to, I think, is more <laughs> accurate, but he's, he's very gentle about oh, that's good. my that's ignorance. Good. That's <laughs> Um, so uh, if you're interested in hearing more um, um, from Robert Sapolsky, he is going to be our preacher at the service upstairs. Um, so it means that um, when he's done, he may sign a few, like four books, but not too many, because you've got to give him a little bit of space between this and the next thing. Um, but the service will be upstairs. There'll be lots of dogs and pets and cats and everything. So um, it may be a little dark barking. Just, just, don't, just <laughs> That's... keep going through it, you know? <laughs> hey, I, I teach. I have classrooms yeah, right, full of completely. students. <laughs> 
<laughs> you have classrooms full of students with their computers up watching the internet <laughs> right, or, or barking. Or, or barking. <laughs> Um, so please join me for next week. Our guest will be Jeff Chang. Um, Jeff Chang um, is Race Forward's Vice President of Narrative Arts and Cultures. Um, it's going to be a conversation about race, culture, and resegregation. He's a person who's wrought, written the, the history of hip hop, lots of things like that. He's going to be great. Um, and if you can, please make a donation. Um, there's a little box there for the donations. We appreciate any gift that you can make. And please join with me in thanking um, Robert for being here. <laughs>